Just because the basketball world is shut down doesn't mean your knowledge of the game should too. Sports Business Classroom is here to go in-depth on a different area of the business of basketball each week. Coming to you live from his home office, here's your host, Bo Estes. And welcome inside my home office. I'm Bo Estes. This is another edition of the SBC Web Show. And if you can see right now, we got a couple of names and faces basketball fans will no doubt be familiar with. First up, one of my coworkers down at NBA TV, Matt Weiner. Matt, how are you and the family doing? So far, so good. We're hanging in, just trying to stay out of everyone else's way. And <laughs> I think I'm doing the same thing. Uh, with Bleacher Report and the Full 48 Pod, Howard Beck. Uh, up in New York. How are things in New York, Howard? Um, you know, we finally have some spring weather to go with spring. So that's a plus. Nice to get outside occasionally and, uh, you know, have it actually be pleasant since we've seen enough of the inside. Okay, we'll get back to these guys in just a moment. But before we get too far, we want to thank all of our first responders, all the people that are helping to keep us safe, the frontline workers. I live uh, near Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, so we see doctors, we see nurses, and, you know, I'd like to add in the people that deliver your pizza, your groceries, all those people that are keeping us safe and keeping the Thunderbirds down, uh, thanks to them, and, and our youth sports operators, the coaches, the leagues, and even those kids that are playing in those leagues, man, we miss you guys, we can't wait till you get back. Uh, finally, this show, SBC's web show, is brought to you by Hall Pass Media, so if you want to learn more about our entire inventory of shows, head on over to hallpassnetwork.com slash web dash shows and learn a little bit more about all of this. And with that, uh, let's dig into the show. Guys, I think the basketball world has had their eyes focused on this last dance. It's really kept us going for five to five weeks, those 10 episodes, uh, Matt, you were you've been involved in broadcasting for a long time, so you surely remember the Bulls and that run they were on. What will you remember about this documentary? Well, you know, it's interesting looking at it now because you got to remember, unlike Howard, I wasn't covering the NBA in the 90s. I was working in local TV, so I was worried about the teams in my local market. The Bulls, for me, I observed more as a fan. So you know, seeing some of the inside stuff, not only from the media perspective, but from the player's perspective and all the great archival video has been amazing. And the, the thing that strikes me about the project as a whole is that it managed to be both nostalgic and, and novel. Nostalgic because we all remember those teams really well and novel because of all this, this mothballed film that's been sitting on shelves for two plus decades now uh, of things that, you know, we had never seen before. And that's been amazing. And and beyond that, just the simple access to Michael Jordan uh, over those three interviews that they did, the amount of time they were able to spend with someone who is pretty reticent to speak with media these days or for the last couple of decades since his Bulls run, um, and his apparently candid answers about most of the topics they threw at him. I, I mean, you know, it, it was it was pretty riveting stuff over those five weeks. And Howard, you saw some of this up close covering the NBA. Uh, the documentary that they put together and, and the feeling that you got from that versus what you remember about being up close. How did how did the documentary and that experience mesh? How did it work for you? Well, I appreciate you both, um, you know, giving the sense of my 90s expertise, <laughs> which maybe I should just make up at this point. But in fact, I didn't start covering the league until 97, 98, the actual last dance season. And I was completely immersed with the Shaq and Kobe Lakers. So I only really saw the Jordan Bulls up close twice, the two times they played the Lakers home and away. And I did not cover the finals that year because, uh, well, the newspaper I worked for was a <clears throat> little cheap. Um, <laughs> so, no. Yeah, a little. Um, so, you know, my, my experience with the 90s Bulls is pretty much as a fan. Um, I was still based out in California at that time. And having grown up in the Bay Area during a time when the Warriors were, let's just say, not great, um, I was more of a Niners fan, A's fan. Uh, like the Warriors were barely on our radar. And so um, like a lot of people who were not married to a particular team, I just became a de facto Bulls fan in the 90s. I, you know, that's that's what we all watched. You know, who didn't love watching Michael Jordan? And so having covered the league for 22 years, um, 23 
uh, at this point, uh, but mostly post Jordan. It's really enjoyable actually to see this from two vantage points. One was as a fan who didn't see all the behind the scenes stuff back then, but who has a sense of it because of the league that I have covered since then. And a lot of the people who were, you know, sewn into this documentary, um, whether it's my own colleagues in the media, guys like David Aldridge and Jay Adande, or whether it's Phil Jackson, who obviously I covered in LA for five years. It, it's, it's two different levels that I felt like I was experiencing it on. And I would just second everything that Matt said. Getting all that behind the scenes footage was incredible. They absolutely delivered on that note. The storytelling itself, the pacing of it, I thought was fantastic. And getting, yes, all the raw candor from not just Michael, but from Scotty, from Dennis Rodman, from Horace Grant, everybody. I, I just, I do think it gave us a different kind of appreciation. It wasn't just a review or for younger viewers, an introduction to those bulls and how great they were and how great Jordan was. We did get a new understanding and, you know, people can pick it apart a thousand different ways. And I understand all the critiques, but I think this thing delivered and then some, and it was 10 hours of really well-spent time for everyone. And, and especially of course, at a time like now when we really needed it. So. Yeah, I would say not to interrupt, Bo. I would say, you know, is it the greatest documentary ever made? I don't know that it that it is necessarily, but the access which we just haven't had before to Jordan in particular, but to those teams is unprecedented, and that made it that alone made it uh, an incredible ride over those ten weeks. Uh, a couple other points about Howard. First of all, Howard, clearly, I just think you're much much older than you are. Um, <laughs> all this no, gray, okay. all this gray in the beard. <laughs> Uh, but but I did when you when you mentioned the folks that you've been around over the course of your time covering the NBA, I did have that reaction over and over again as I watched it because I've worked with a lot of those people. Obviously, Isaiah Thomas works with us at NBA TV, but I've worked periodically with people like Scottie Pippen, um, other folks with the Bulls, and cross paths with so many of them over the years that to see them uh, in that light and reflecting back on that time was was an interesting perspective and a different one for me. I don't know if you guys got the same sense that I did, but it, it brought me back and it made me remember how maybe it seemed so difficult that last year, that last three-peat with Pippen out at the start of the year, with all that was going on, this team seemed tired down the stretch. Utah seemed really close. Did you get that sense as well, either of you? Yeah, I would just say to, to jump in, um, the funny thing about covering sports, and this is at least for most of us, I think, the broad strokes are what ingrain in, in our memories, the emotional reactions we may have had, the broad themes, the narratives, as, as people uh, like to call them. But the details get lost. And all we think about the, sh the, the Bulls of the 90s and Jordan is dominance. It's a dynasty. They just you know ran through everybody. Well, no, the, the details are often a lot messier. And throughout the both three-peats, you could see where there were times where uh, maybe, you know, but ball bounces one way or the other, but then especially in the second three feet, of course. And I had forgotten about, or maybe didn't realize just how severe Scottie Pippen's back injury was in the decisive game six and 98. Um, and just how dysfunctional that team was that season. I mean, I do remember the broad, again, the broad strokes, it was going to be their last season together, period. They had already predetermined Phil Jackson's not coming back. Jordan's not coming back without Phil, all of that. But, um, how many times Rodman just kind of disappeared along the way and Scotty, how bitter he, like, I really had just very little memory of just how toxic that had gotten between Scotty and the bulls. And so those are the things like it's, it's great for something like this to kind of refresh our memory. And, and again, because we had all the modern day interviews too, to add that new layer of understanding to just how tough it was. And I think it should make people appreciate what they accomplished that much more because no, it wasn't just that they had the most supreme talent. Yes. They had the, you know, the Jordan, you know, arguably the greatest of all time, but it's an older Jordan and it's a Jordan who's on his third straight finals and sixth and eight years. And there's all the, the fatigue that comes behind that. It's Scotty, not at his peak anymore. It's Rodman getting very close to falling off a cliff and a bunch of, with all due respect, fairly average replacement level NBA players around them. Did you get a similar sense, Matt, as they're coming down the stretch, especially in that 1998 year? Yeah, for sure. And like Howard said, it was a bit of a refresher course for me because, you know, as memory fades, and I'm not one of those people who has a photographic memory of every game I've ever seen, 
Um, you know, I, I tend to distill that era down to a few key moments along the way. And I remember the John Paxson shot and the Steve Kerr shot and obviously the Michael Jordan shot over Brian Russell and some other key moments. But the storylines, uh, you know, other than the broad strokes of that, this was going to be the end of it. And Phil was gone and Jerry Krause had said what he had said and everybody was going away. You know, I'd, I'd forgotten a lot of the Scottie Pippen drama, and I, in particular, completely forgotten about Scottie's injury in that game six in 98. So, yeah, there was a lot of stuff that I had sort of glossed over in my mind that I was reminded of by this. Well, so let's let's jump into another topic. We, uh, we're trying to give our students an idea of the path forward in, in the business that we all work in, uh, the media. So let's talk about changes that you may see to covering games and Matt, for you broadcasting games going forward, Howard, first for you, uh, how will it change your experience and your ability to do your job if you're not able to go into an arena at first, if you're not able to go into a locker room? I remember hearing you recently uh, talk about the importance of being in that locker room for a reporter. Yeah, well, let's start with this, that we don't really know what the parameters, what the rules of engagement are going to be once the NBA starts up again. Uh, that, you know, it, it's, it is not the most important thing that the NBA has to figure out in all these logistics, but they'll get to that eventually. And I'm sure they've got an outline somewhere. Um, and, and those of us who are with the Pro Basketball Writers Association, we've had those conversations, that dialogue with the league. So uh, I have every reason to believe that there will be on-site access for not just beat writers who cover specific teams who are playing those games, whether it's regular season or straight to playoffs, the beat writers who are normally there, I believe will still be there. Maybe not in the same numbers, but they'll be there. And then I think there will probably be, and again, I, this is just my feel for it right now. I'm not saying we know anything for sure, but I believe there will be a number of, or X number of slots for people who are classified as national writers, which would be what, what I do these days. I'm not attached to a particular team. And so I think we will have on-site print and broadcast media that's my belief. I hope, certainly hope that's the case. If it's not, we're going to have some uh, very vigorous debates uh, with the league um, because it's important. We are still the conduit to the fans and someone needs to be there to, uh, to, to document this, to ask the right questions, to talk to players, talk to coaches. What will be different though, what I assume will be different and maybe for the foreseeable future uh, until there's a vaccine um, they're going to probably want to, you know, keep a certain distance. Now, if we go down there, if we're in the so-called bubble, whatever that bubble is, even if it's a porous bubble, everyone's going to get tested every day. Everyone's going to be under the same guidelines of don't leave, don't see other people. And I think if we all stick to that, we should be able to walk straight up to a player or a coach and have the normal conversations that we would have at, at any other time uh, covering the league. Um. I don't know if that'll be the way they handle it or not, or if they're going to want to enforce some distance for safety reasons. But I think what, what will really change, probably, unfortunately, for this, this time being, is that the most important thing and the most gratifying part for us is the relationships that you create, the rapport you create by talking to players every day, coaches every day. Um, that, that rapport is critical. That's how we get the better stories. That's why you don't get just the... Uh, here's the play we ran and here's why this we made this shot or we missed that shot or whatever. Like if all you ever got was a, a bunch of like, you know, X's and O's after the fact that that wouldn't be interesting. We cover these sports. People watch these sports, read about these these athletes because they're interested in who they are as people, the dynamics between them, the relationships. And for someone like me who specializes more these days in features and analysis, I've got to have that face time. I got to be there to see them and to have off the record conversations. And again, that doesn't mean it's anonymous sources and all this stuff. It's just, it's just conversation. It's just, that's how you build up the rapport and the trust to get better insight into what makes people tick. So uh, that will be my biggest concern as, as we re-engage is, is to try to still be able to do our jobs at that kind of level um, that we're still, you know, giving readers and, and, and viewers, you know, the insight that they should get. Yeah, Howard just touched on on my biggest fear more as a consumer, really, because I'm a, for the most part, a studio guy. I'm going to be in a studio, presumably at some point, talking about basketball again. Um, but I'm not usually in the arenas. I'm I'm not at the games typically. Um, I think the new the news will get covered because, you know, you can do press conferences. You can have somebody at a podium and keep the media spread apart enough to get the questions in about the X's and O's and the injuries and those sorts of things. That part of it, I don't worry about at all. 
what concerns me the most, my fear is that what's really going to be impacted is the great feature writing that Howard alluded to a moment ago, because that requires access, not only for the interview that makes its way into a feature is on the record comments, but the background stuff that you get, as Howard knows, from being around a team, from being around players and agents and coaches and everybody else within an organization, because you pick up things along the way. And a great feature writer, Howard and his brethren, can paint a picture about a time and a place, whether it's in the arena, uh, on the court, or at someone's home, or in their background, uh, by gathering up all that information that you can't do if you're not around those folks every day. And those are the details and the nuance that I fear will get lost in the short term, at least. Howard, Matt mentions feature writing. What are some of the stories that you're going to be interested in? Obviously, it's a different time, and we don't know the exact way they'll come back, what the format will look like. What are some of the stories you think people will be interested in that you'll want to cover when this does come back? Wow, that's a great question. I mean, it, it really depends on what format they come back under. Um, are they bringing back all 30 teams? Are they trying to finish out some part of the regular season? I don't think that that's worthwhile, personally. Um, I know there's a lot of money issues involved, and so it's easy for me to say, eh, forget the you know tens of millions. Um, to me, the, I mean, the, mo the most practical, you know, pragmatic approach to this is cut straight to the playoffs. Fewer players involved, fewer coaches, fewer bodies, period. Little, you know, less testing would be necessary, less, uh, fewer people to monitor. Um, but uh, look, it's, it's, the, it's the obvious, right? We got through just enough of the season to think, oh, wow, you know, the Lakers have really emerged as, as, as what seemed like the clear favorite here. Well, the Clippers probably still think they have something to say about that. And the Bucks have something to say about that if that's their finals opponent. And, you know, looming there in, in the East, you know, Toronto and Boston and Philly are still, I will hold on a second. You know, we, we, we still think we can make a run at knocking off the Bucks. It's all the things that it, it's all the themes that stalled out a couple months ago, all the things we were talking about, you know, it, it's, it's as if, you know, we, you just hit pause and, you know, you take off pause and our conversation will just pick up where it left off. I, I don't, the only thing that's new, the new wrinkles are, well, uh, Simmons and Embiid should be healthy. <laughs> when when things resume um uh, that knee injury that knocked Giannis out for a couple of games oh wow well Giannis should be fine now so we have this really strange kind of everybody's now back to you would think you know uh base level of of health um except that now they all have to get in basketball shape and a lot of them couldn't even shoot at baskets during the last couple of months they they like that that was not even available to a lot of them so um the, the very first story or, or string of stories all across the league, especially if you have all 30 teams back, is who's in shape, who's not, probably none of them. Um, how quickly can they get back in basketball shape? And then there's going to be a lot of, of, of watching of like how many minutes are guys going to play, consecutive minutes. Uh, the, the injury concerns, I think, if you talk to trainers and, and medical folks, the injury concerns are going to be much higher than normal. What about you, Matt? Is there any particular story? I, I know you said you've been working from home. You're going to be in the studio. And typically you go on the road some for conference finals or finals, if I'm not mistaken. But any stories that you're interested in as well? Yeah, typically only the NBA finals um, on the road. And I would, I would love to be there again if that happens, whenever that is and wherever that might be, a uh, city to be named. I think it's a lot of the stuff Howard touched on with this, you know, with this hiatus. You just don't know what you're getting when it comes back. Presumably, if the league decides to move forward, they're going to build in two to three weeks of training camp so players can get into some sort of basketball shape. Um, it does bring into play players who were hurt who could theoretically come back healthy. I know some coaches have already said John Wall, for instance, is not going to come back and finish the season just to do it. Uh, and then you've had some other players who've made the opposite decision. It was interesting to me to see last week that Boyan Bogdanovich has decided to have wrist surgery and is done for whatever is left of the season, presumably with an eye toward next year. Now, does that mean they, they don't think they're going to come back, or does that just uh, kind of a cost-benefit analysis to say we think we're better off next year, maybe we have a better shot next year? I don't know. Th those questions about injuries and health are, are, are paramount for the obvious reasons, the virus and keeping people safe, but also because of the layoff. Howard, earlier you talked about, uh, you know, it's going to be a, a, essentially a bubble. For the people that are in there, uh, wherever this uh, wherever this season resumes, but presumably less than every media member that is with every team, so there there potentially could be less stories coming out. Uh, does that impact the news cycle at all? If it, if it's fewer voices that are in there asking the questions, 
Uh, does it drive the news cycle in a different way? Is there anything that, that we could expect to change with that? So, Bo, my guess, best guess is that, yeah, there will be fewer of us on site. And certainly when you're talking about the conference finals and finals, when there's hundreds, thousands sure. of folks, um, it, the numbers will be much, much smaller. They, they, they almost have to be. I don't think the volume of stories or overall content uh, will necessarily go down because, you know, the way the media ecosystem works these days is, there are the, the frontline people who are there covering every last shoot around and practice and pregame and postgame. And then there's aggregators and people who do analyze, you know, analysis from home uh, or from wherever they might work on a given day. And so th that those layers will still and that that ecosystem where you're kind of feeding off of what you see on the TV or what you've seen written, like all that will still be there. I just think there will be fewer bodies in the gym, fewer people to ask the direct questions um, you know, I, I, I think all the, the basics will still get covered. You know, when I started covering the league in 1997 and it, it's still the early days of the internet, it's pre social media, it's pre blogs, pre, uh, you know, pre the company I work for bleacher report was years and years away from existing when I first started covering the league at that time, you've got newspaper beat writers, the wire services, maybe some local radio and TV, but you don't have the just masses of people in, in the locker room. And I think overall, you've got pretty good, you know, spread of content and, and a diversity of content. There's more diversity of it now because there are people who cover, you know, just the X's and O's, just do film analysis, just do analytics. Just, and those things can all happen without access. But for those of us who are, are reporters, first and foremost, who are journalists who need to be there and have direct conversations, both on and off the record, repeatedly over the course of, of, of a, you know, several days or entire playoff series. Um, as long as that's continuing in, in, in a fashion that we're all used to, I think the rest of the ecosystem is fine because they'll be able to do what they've always done off the TV or feeding off of the, the, the uh, primary content that's being uh, generated on site from reporters. Matt, one thing, I, I, I guess we talked earlier about the last dance, uh, and we've all sort of been quarantined for a couple months at this point. Is there any new content ideas that you think could come out of this? I know I know you've worked on Beyond the Paint, I believe. Uh, is, is there more documentary type shows that people might start showing an interest in? What could you imagine uh, going forward? I, I guess what I imagine is that there's more technologically driven content moving forward. There are people way smarter than me about computers and social media out there who are cooking up stuff right now that I, I couldn't possibly imagine that'll probably be really popular a year from now and will spawn other content that is completely different five years from now. But that's also a trend that's continued pre-coronavirus and pre-quarantine um, because of technology. You know broadcast entities in particular, because that's where I work, are less and less interested in big money productions. They're less and less interested in spending a ton of money to get a two camera crew with the lights and everything and set up in a room for a couple of hours for an athlete to come in and spend 30 minutes with a reporter like me because it's expensive. It's the same reason, if you think more broadly, it's the same reason in part why reality TV has come become so popular in the last 20 years. You don't have to pay writers. You don't have to pay a lot of directors. You don't have to set up sets all over the place. It's it's relatively cheap and it rates well enough to do well. Um, I think this particular hiatus is probably opening some eyes uh, amongst executives about how they can produce things more cost effectively. And I think, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. We're going to see stuff that we're not even conceiving of right now. Howard, getting back to the idea of access and stuff like that, do you think that the, this, particularly these playoffs, is it is it a time where players and agents can control the story more since there'll be less reporters there? Or do you expect it to be the same sort of relationships that you guys have had? Yeah, it's hard to say. It really is. Um, you know, those dynamics are ever evolving. And, you know, uh, I, I do think players and the agencies that represent players uh, – they, they, you know, they use a lot more of, of, of uh, their own discretion um, in these relationships than they did when I first started. Let's put it that way. And so, you know, uh, the, the, you know, in a situation like this, the league, especially when we get deep in the playoffs, the league is really the one that manages the day to day. 
and they do a, a fantastic job with their PR staff of making sure that everybody fulfills their obligations, players and coaches. And so, again, it kind of depends on where they pick up with all of this. If it's some regular season games or even the early rounds of the playoffs, um, because of the NBA, again, we're making some assumptions here. We're assuming it's all going to be under one roof or maybe two roofs if there's you know, a Vegas and an Orlando, however this works out. But the league is going to have to be much more hands-on than it ever would be otherwise during normal regular season games or even normal early, early round playoffs. They don't usually get involved at the league level in terms of managing the day-to-day -day with the media until the conference finals. But it may be every round. And it may be whatever, again, if there are regular season games, if it's a play-in tournament, however they configure this. And I think that could only benefit us because it means that league PR is going to make sure, especially under these circumstances, where if we've gone on site, and I don't know if I would or not at this stage, um, if you have made the effort to, to travel under, in, in a circumstance like this, in an environment that we're in, and to take on some extra risk with regard to your health, as, as you necessarily are in a case like this, even if the league is also maybe providing daily tests and whatever else to try to ensure that everyone is safe. Um, I would think that the league would also understand that uh, these circumstances being as extreme as they are, and you've made that extra effort to be there, the expense, the personal risk, the personal sacrifice, you might be there for a month, that they will do everything possible to make sure that there's you know, a good reason for you to be there. And that means that access has to be there. So we, we've talked a lot about our work, your work, Howard, your work, Matt, uh, and how it will look in the coming months. Uh, our students, we have a lot of students who are getting out of college now who are looking for a job and the whole world sort of press pause at this point. Uh, I, I'll get both your takes on this, but uh, Matt, we'll start with you. What's what do you think that these young students who want to get into the media, but, you know, basketball has been paused, sports have been paused. What could they be doing right now to be productive in this time? Same thing I tell students at, at any time, whether, you know, it's an extraordinary circumstance like this or, or any other time. Do the reps, whatever it is you're trying to do. If you're trying to be an on air host or a reporter or a play by play person, do that. Uh, there are games on TV to do. Uh, if you want to do play-by-play, -play, get the old recorder out or your phone or whatever. Record it. Listen to it. Get better at it. Um, hone your, your craft. Uh, if you want to be a reporter, talk into your – put your phone somewhere in front of you. Make up a set of facts. Find an old story about, uh, about whatever it is you want to cover um, and do a report. No one has to see it. It doesn't really matter. But the technology allows you to do it and give your own feedback. Maybe maybe show it to somebody uh, who, who understands the business a little bit. If you have someone like that in your life, a mentor, if you've been through a, a broadcast or communications program, show it to a faculty member, get some feedback if you can. But the more you do it, the better you get. I, I always joke about my first job in TV, which was in Billings, Montana, and the news director at the time uh, told me on my interview that there were more cattle than people there. Um, that's true. Um, but it was the best experience in terms of finding out who I was as a broadcaster and what I was good at, and more importantly, what I wasn't good at. Uh, I wasn't going to be the funny guy. I wasn't going to be the kooky guy. You know, I, I, I did what I did well, and I got away from the stuff that I didn't do very well. And I think that's hugely important. And you don't have to have a job to necessarily find out that stuff you just have to have some time and put in a little effort i think you're how, how are your thoughts on that <laughs> thank you howard <laughs> <laughs> do you want to piggyback on that howard um i would like to be as funny as matt weiner um, <laughs> i would like to see montana right about now instead of uh, streets of brooklyn i could use yeah. that, that that break um my advice to people coming into the into the business sure yeah yeah well no more more specifically what they can be doing now when, mm -hmm. when sports aren't going on and, and maybe jobs aren't as easy to pursue right now to improve their position when things start to get back to normal and opportunities start to open up. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the same as what Matt said. And, you know, look, if you're somebody who wants to be on air, then, you know, getting practicing reps in your in your own uh, bedroom or living room with, you know, old games on or whatever, that would be a way to, to you know, if you want to be play by play, if you want to be a writer, you know, I mean, it's it's the same advice no matter who I'm talking to at what stage of their careers or if they're aspiring and they're still in high school or college. Um, you, you can't become a good writer without writing a lot. 
and it doesn't even have to be read by anyone. And that's to echo what Matt's saying there. These things don't have to be for the world. They could just be for you. Uh, if you can find someone who will publish your latest screed on what you think, you know, the, the warriors need to do in their gap year rebuild, you know, Hey, you know, write it up, try to get it published somewhere. Even if it's just on, on a fan site or wherever people have gotten their foothold in the business that way. But the only way to become a good writer, a better writer is to write a lot and to read a lot too, that that part of it is always, it sounds almost like a cliche now. I think it's what all of us in the business would say, but um, read a lot and not just sports and not just the sport that you're most interested in. Uh, you know, read the news section of the newspaper if you can find a newspaper or a newspaper website. Um, read books, uh, you know, find authors whose style or whose voice, whose uh, delivery method, everybody's got a different way of doing it. And you, you, the more of those you read, the more of those ideas you pick up, even when you don't realize you are, it's a lot of it's kind of osmosis and you find yourself, you know, uh, you know, echoing back some of those techniques yourself later. And, you know, even for myself, you know, the way I write now that whatever my style is, I don't know how I would even define that, but it's pretty different than it was 10 years ago, certainly 20 years ago. And it, it's, it's fun and sometimes a little cringy looking back to see, you know, where you came from and, and what you realize is, oh, I thought I was pretty good back then. And you look back and you go, like, no, that sucked. And then occasionally you look back and you go like, oh, wow, this held up. Actually, I was, oh, it's okay. On that day, I was actually pretty good. But you find that your voice changes even though you don't really realize it as it's happening. And that's just the evolution of, of writing or I, I think probably of, of any craft like this where it's, it is more art than science. Within the industry, oh, Howard, uh, within the industry, your style is just simply known as Beckian. I think that's a common <laughs> term. Most people throw that around. I hear that all the time. Can I can I say he what he funny. said? Can I, I say know. what he said though? Read everything. I you, you know, if we're talking to students, read everything. Read everything you can. Read again, newspapers. Well, I, I, I like holding a newspaper in my hand. I like reading it. And I start with the news section. Know Give what's some... going on in the world because that's it's gonna come up in your broadcast, in your writing. We've seen it. This is the perfect example. The period we're in right now. The real world will invariably interfere with the sports world you're covering. It's going to happen, and you should have some clue about what's happening in the rest of the world. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's throw it out to you guys, Matt. You first suggested reading. If there's if there's a book, if there's something, anything, you suggest, anything. anything. I mean, seriously, literally, whatever you're interested in. It's fiction. It's nonfiction. I'm reading a. a this sounds sort of highfalutin. I'm reading a Churchill biography right now. Um, I'm not a history buff in particular, but it's uh, it's really well written and it's a subject I don't know a ton about. It's about Churchill during World War II. Um, does, is that going to help me specifically cover the NBA at NBA TV? No, not necessarily, Maybe. but it makes me a well, a better rounded, more well-informed person. And who knows, as, as Howard said, by osmosis, I could pick up something. I want you to open your next studio show with the Churchill quote. I'm I'm now <laughs> expecting that. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> We're going to hold you to that, Howard. Anything you suggest? Uh, anything you're reading now that you, you'd like to pass along? Um, no, not nothing in specific. I mean, I think it's you know read the things that interest you most because then you'll stick with them. And you know if Churchill excites you, by all means, go pick up the Churchill biography. But uh, if you want to read, if you're an, an, you know, specifically aspiring to be an NBA writer, then, you know, like I've got every one of Jack McCallum's books, you know, back here. I've got a bunch of Frank DeFord back here. Um, you know, David Halberstam, like just, you know, Sam Smith's Jordan Rules, I think, is sitting over here. Like, go find, you know, th like they're not that hard to find. Um, get the books that are, you know, by some of the best writers who have ever covered this particular sport. Uh, and... And, and read those because you'll pick up not just how to put the story together, writing style, which is, you know, an important aspect of this, but you also see the depth of the reporting that goes into a lot of these books. And it's important to, to kind of feel that or, uh, you know, kind of understand that too, because it gives you a sense of, oh, well, if I would have wanted, if I wanted to do something like this, this is the level of detail I'm going to have to get to. Well, how do I do that? Um, so it's, it, it can be kind of a, a, a template, a blueprint, for doing that yourself. But yeah, I mean, look, in, in general, it's, I would never say there's any, there's not one book or one writer who you have to immerse yourself in. Just, just read a lot and, and read the people who, again, who speak to you, who you think really do it in a way that, that kind of sings that, that has a, a certain, uh, you know, rhythm to it. 
that you think like, I, you know, I enjoy this. There's a good momentum to this story. You know, can I do it this way? Uh, that's, that's kind of what I look for. Um, last thing, uh, before we let you guys go, uh, your crystal ball is better than most, uh, cause you talked to some people around the league. Uh, let's get into how you expect, just use your crystal ball. What, what would be your best guess? How this plays off the end of this season? Is it some regular season and playoffs? Uh, and then is, is this all trying to get us timed up for maybe perhaps a December start? How, how do you expect that all to play out? Howard, we'll start with you. I've been trying my best, Bo, to avoid making predictions like this because I, I think we're all, you know, we're just we're just groping in the dark here. I mean, we, we don't know for sure. It certainly seems like there's some momentum right now. But, you know, if we wake up tomorrow or next week and there's some huge second wave of outbreaks of, of the virus, that could throttle whatever plans the league is trying to put together. So, you know, let's let's be humble here about the fact that we re, we really don't know. And though there are some signals coming from the league, I'm not assuming anything. All that said, it certainly feels like where they're heading is some kind of mid to late July restart. And if you assume that that's the case, and when you consider that you still have to have a lottery and a draft and a training camp before next season, and even though you can push back the start of next season to whatever, early December, mid-December, I don't think that's what the NBA necessarily wants to do. And I don't know that it's what the players would want to do. Do people really want to start sacrificing next summer? when players have families and kids who are out of school. So, you know, I got to think that they're going to try to do this in a way that gets them through quickly. And I got to believe too, by the way, not every player and not every team wants to come back right now. Like for what, if if you're the Atlanta Hawks, if you're the Cavaliers, if you're the Knicks, the Warriors, what are you doing? Like why, what's the point after two months out, three months out, dragging everybody back to get them in shape, for games that you know are meaningless. You think there's some, I, I apologize for saying this NBA, you think there's some really bad basketball with teams that are already checked out in late March and April <laughs> in a normal season? <laughs> Imagine how much less motivation these guys will have now if you're on one of the teams that has no shot at the playoffs. So that's where you. That's where the incentivizing teams with the play-in tournament or whatever might make more sense, but that's that much more complicated. So I, I'm going more here on what I think makes more sense to me than what I think the NBA will actually try to do because they have the money interest in, 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 at stake here. But I think limit the number of teams you're bringing back, start with the playoffs, shorten the rounds if you have to, get through it. You could do it in a month to six weeks, and then you don't have as much impact on the start of next season. Matt, you're, Howard made a good point. I mean, it, it's unpredictable because the virus – could change things tomorrow. Uh, any sense as it sits here today, how it will play out in your mind? No, not really. There's just, there's so many factors we don't know. And you read, you read stories about the possibility of a second spike. Um, and we just don't know how that's going to play out. Uh, I, I'm fairly pessimistic when it comes to the season returning in full, uh, certainly in terms of a regular season and, and financial implications aside. And I know they're significant for all parties involved. But just in terms of logistics, um, the practicality of it, the health implications, it's fairly daunting to me to put 30 teams theoretically in one spot or even 15 each in two spots, even if you reduce the traveling parties down to say 20 per team, and that's fairly bare bones, yeah. then you've, you've already got 300 people there who need to be more or less quarantined during that time. And I know they're talking about having people being able to come and go. That doesn't include families, if they're allowing that. Uh, that doesn't include NBA officials. It doesn't include referees. It doesn't include uh, staff for the hotel or resort, wherever they're staying. You're talking about hundreds and hundreds of people who are going to have to be together and more or less stuck in those spots for at least a couple of weeks in order to finish out a regular season. So for me, what, what makes most sense is something like July 15th is a start date for an 18 playoff. Uh, you can do the full seven game rounds that way. You could probably be done in a month or five weeks or something like that if you really jam it in, maybe six weeks. Um, you can crown a champion. And let's be honest, to Howard's point, you know, and this is true of any NBA season, but aside from the eight teams that, uh, that would make that playoff right now, is there really somebody out there? Is there the New York Knicks from the lockout season, for instance, who would come in as an eighth seed? and make the NBA Finals. Is there really a team like that out there? He would say, you know, I, I feel that that season in 2020, if this team had just been given a chance 
they might have won the championship. I don't, I don't know that that team exists out there. This way, you get a representative sample of the contenders, as most of us would define them, and certainly based on their records to this point, and they have a chance to play real playoff games and decide a real champion. Is it, is it imperfect? Of course, but nothing is going to be perfect. You're saying eight total, not eight from each conference? I'm, eight saying, total? I'm saying eight total, four from each conference. You know, I, I'm sure the league would love to make it a 16-team playoff. I would love to make it a 16-team playoff. I just sure. don't know if, if that is, you know, I just don't know if that's practical at this point, particularly keeping in mind the start of next season and how far potentially you want to push that back or, or if you want to push it back. The only the only team I could think of jumping up, and it, and it seems unlikely with the news you're hearing out of it, is if Brooklyn suddenly had the players you know they have sitting over there on the sidelines. They keep saying Kevin Durant's not going to come back. Right. We don't know how long this is going to be pushed back. But if he perhaps came back, that would change things in my mind. But it seems unlikely, right? Right, right. All right, Howard, Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for your time, your insights, and everything like that. It's been a pleasure. It's been a good learning experience for our students. And, and we look forward to seeing you guys back on the job soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, appreciate it, Bo. One word to leave you with, Becky and <laughs> Becky. And... <laughs> hey, keep us posted on that Churchill biography. We'll expect a blog <laughs> post soon. I want a full book just... report. I want quotes. I'll just start to tweeting running reviews of the chapter by chapter. <laughs> there you go. That's what America, <laughs> that's what America really craves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Weiner tweets Churchill. That's what we yeah. need right now. Thank you so much, fellas. And, and thanks, everybody, for joining us on the SBC Web Show. We want to remind you that we have other shows you got to check out. Pickup Game with Seth Greenberg live next Wednesday. And, of course, to check out all our shows, it's the hallpassnetwork.com slash web shows and Basketball Jones. That's with Mark Jones. That's live every Tuesday. So Basketball Jones and the Pickup Game. Those are our shows. This one to the SBC Web Show. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody.